So first of all, I'd like to thank Boaz and, and Miriam for allowing me to participate in this conference. In the late summer of last year, I was in Belarus conducting research, both in local archives and in the field, interviewing eyewitnesses to the German invasion. Since I was in Belarus shortly before the parliamentary elections of late, late September, I asked an acquaintance during a stroll through his town if he intended to vote, and more generally what he thought of Lukashenko, the president of Belarus since 1994. I am prepared to tell you everything I think about Lukashenko, he said, and then laughing, continued, but just don't write it down. As my acquaintance's response illustrates, there are some things just too delicate or dangerous to generate a written record. Although government agencies and the government-controlled mass media issue glowing reports about the economy, security, and direction of Belarus, anyone who has recently been there can attest to the tension that exists between the Belarusian people and its government since Lukashenko violently cracked down on protesters of a sham election in December of 2010. Historians writing in 50 years about the events and zeitgeist of Belarus today would miss much if they limited themselves to primary documentation, even if it included the demands and decrees of the government protesters found on the internet. I would even argue that the viewpoints of the government and the protesters represent two minority opinions today, with the vast majority of Belarusians, like my acquaintance, remaining silently between these two poles. In this paper, I argue that historians should address the limits of primary documentation by expanding their use of oral history as an important complementary source. The use of oral testimony in the field of Holocaust studies has lagged behind other such subfields as military history. The methodology of triangularization, in this case using both victim and perpetrator sources to plot the intersection of the German army and genocide, offers the best chance to describe and elucidate events surrounding the Holocaust more accurately and authentically. The examples from my research concerning the Wehrmacht's 35th Division in this paper illustrate what new perspectives can be gained from engaging disparate sources, such as the division's war diaries, soldiers' letters from the front, and post-war literature, with the oral testimony pro provided by both perpetrator and victim sources. I conclude with my opinion that the reward gained by incorporating sources such as survivor testimony that have been traditionally viewed as suspect will outweigh the risk of perpetrating, excuse me, perpetrating dubious or unfounded claims. Uh, due to time limitations, I'm going to skip some background information as to why I chose this particular German army division. And also in light of the title of this conference, I'm going to skip contextualizing the Yitzkor books and USC Shaw Foundation collection, as I believe we are all familiar with these sources. This will hopefully give me enough time to fully illustrate how survivor testimony can, be, can combine effectively with primary documentation, in this case the war diaries of the 35th Division, to illustrate how, quote unquote, ordinary German soldiers witnessed or participated in the persecution of Soviet Jewry. The following examples of this approach concern the actions of the 35th Division in the three Belarusian towns of Bilitsa, Dvachich, and Zhetl during the first 10 days of the German invasion. So I begin with Bilitsa. On the morning of the 28th of June, 1941, the 35th Division was tasked with the capture and defense of several Belarusian towns along the Niemen River to prevent the further escape of encircled Red Army units from the Bialystok Minsk cauldron. The division sent two companies of its infantry regiment 111 directly to Bielitsa, one of these towns, to be joined later by an additional company of infantry regiment 109. The war diary of the division contains only this brief reference to the fighting that subsequently took place, and I quote, the securing and blocking of the routes across the Niemen by Bielitsa carried out by the staff of the Panzerjäger Abteilung 35, um, the um, anti-tank unit of the 35th, 14th Company of Infantry Regiment 111, and reinforced 6th Company of Infantry Regiment 111, and a bridgehead formed. Contact with enemy. Opponent attacks the bridgehead from the northeast. Enemy also located southwest. Reinforcements sent. The situation is restored 
Bielitsa is ablaze. The question of whether Bielitsa caught fire during the battle for the town is not addressed in this source. In a subsequent report filed by the 14th Company, we learned that military operations and the persecution of the local populace had become intractably intertwined. By 7.30 that evening, the details of a coordinated punitive measure were recorded in the report as follows. The 6th Company pursues the dispersed enemy and cleanses the town under the command of Lieutenant Dome. Because civilians participated in the battle against German soldiers, 10 men were executed as hostages, Bielitsa put to the torch by the 6th Company. In 1968, the Yitzkor book for Bielitsa, containing the recollections of the Jewish community there, was published in Israel and America. In the 1990s, many of these residents were also interviewed as part of Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation initiative regarding their Holocaust experience. But of these sources, excuse me, both of these sources provide critical information about the reprisals first mentioned, but not detailed, in the German war diaries. Through a comparison of victim testimonies in the report of Infantry 111, two perspectives on the events after the battle emerge that mutually reinforce each other. According to two survivor accounts, immediately following the battle, the German troops, quote, spread through the streets of the town, and anyone who happened to be in their way was shot to death. Unquote. with a further eyewitness recalling the indiscriminate shooting of men, women, and children. While such shootings could appear random to its victims, they were explained under the euphemism of the cleansing of the town that Lieutenant Dome apparently undertook directly after battle. The executions that followed the initial wild shooting in Bielitsa were more orderly and anti-Semitic in nature. Infantry Regiment 111's report states that 10 hostages were executed while victim sources put the number between 12 and 15. It appears that this was largely a reprisal against the Jewish community, although one account mentions the possible inclusion of two Christians among the hostages. The transition from the arbitrary killings of the mid-afternoon to the more orderly procedure later is highlighted by one victim, Shumel Shumonovitz, who managed to survive. And I quote, At that point, a whole list of infractions that we were accused of were presented that the Jews were guilty of. And we were asked what we had to say because we were given three minutes to live. We asked that we be shot, however more quickly as possible. An order was immediately given, fire, and all 12 fell to the ground. I was not hit by a bullet, but I feigned death. The others screamed and were fired upon once again until they expired. The orderly proceeding of the execution is supported by another eyewitness who noted that the German officer commanding the firing squad studied his watch before, at the determined time, yelling, Achtung Feuer. By all accounts, the subsequent raising of the village was a reprisal directed foremost against the Jewish population. The synagogue that had been especially targeted during the cleansing of the town was now put to the torch, although one eyewitness claims that the synagogue was dynamited, a discrepancy that reminds one of the limits of memory. Moreover, the synagogue was the only religious building to be raised by invading German forces in a town that also featured an Eastern Orthodox and a Catholic church. And this synagogue was raised only after the Torah and other holy scriptures had been removed by German soldiers and publicly burned. Both during and after this event, German soldiers spread throughout the town enlisting the help of local anti-Semites to identify Jewish homes. This collaboration seems to have been voluntary and effective. According to two sources, it had been the resident Gentiles that had first told the Germans that Jews, specifically the rabbi, pharmacist, and doctor of the town, had fired on German troops with machine guns. Another eyewitness, Robert Lesser, tells of how a Polish collaborator accompanied the tall, skinny German soldier wearing eyeglasses who was the arsonist, informing him which houses were Jewish owned and therefore to be burned. Before their departure, the units in question posted a sign that read, the town was burned down because civilians had fired upon Germans. I move now to my second example of Dwachich. The example of Dwachich illustrates just how prevalent this anti-Semitic impulse could be in the German army. 
Only days after units of the 35th Army, uh, 35th Infantry Division had raised Bilitsa, another subunit was tasked with the reconnaissance of the small town of Dwacic, only miles from Bilitsa. The first attempt was made on July 1, 1941, and the Divisional War Diary notes that at the cost of one casualty, the reconnaissance troop had captured 30 prisoners. Later that afternoon, the small town was shelled for 15 minutes, and on the next day, a different troop returned, collecting 60 more prisoners. As with the example of Bielitsa, no detailed information is given in the Divisional War Diary to contextualize these missions. Nine months later, in April of 1942, the German officer R, who led the reconnaissance unit on the second mission, wrote down his recollections of this mission, which were probably intended to become part of the divisional history. He described how after the loss of a single soldier, Corporal L, on the first foray, he returned to Dvacic the next day with a stronger contingent, only to find that the town had already been taken by another group from his subunit. When Officer R arrived, this subunit was busy dividing up the population into, quote, prisoners of war, civilians, and Jews, the latter of which there were many, unquote. After a meal of requisitioned bread, butter, eggs, and milk, the troop withdrew, full and satisfied, with even their prisoners beginning their trek into captivity, according to this account, in good spirits. In closing, Officer R wrote, the short story shows that there were also days of happy memories in less than jovial Russia. Dvacic belongs to these few short pleasurable hours that we would not like to forget. The question of the fate of the Jews of Dvacic, who had been selected out of the general population, is clarified by the USC Shaw Foundation testimony of Maya Bronicki, himself belonging to the Jewish community there, and who as a 17-year-old boy participated in the events of the day. As Mr. Bronicki recalled in 1997 about the town's initial contact with the German army, the German army came in. I remember we were looking through the window. Nobody was in the street. Right away they told that all the Jews should come to the center of town. I don't know if all the Jews came to the center of town, but I did, and my father did. Then they brought a killed German, and at the time I didn't know what was the idea of bringing us and putting us against the wall. They had a machine gun in front of us, and we found out later, after they released us, they were going to machine gun us because this German soldier got killed by a sniper from the Russians. But after a while, they let us go and told us to go to the synagogue. They filled up the synagogue and closed the door and left. To the interviewer's question of what happened next, Mr. Bronicky replied, we didn't know how bad they were but we could have lost our lives right there. One of the Gentiles talked out the Germans not to shoot us because we didn't have nothing to do of this German soldier. Only in the evening after the small German task force left Wachich did the Jews leave the synagogue. I move now to my final example of Zettel. The town of Zettel provides another example of how this 35th Infantry Division repeatedly selected Jews for special treatment. After a fierce battle on a hill overlooking Zettel with retreating Soviet forces on the 27th and 28th of June, the advance units of the division entered town and immediately took 50 Jewish men hostage. They announced that should any shots be fired at German soldiers, the hostages would be executed. Later on, the evening of June 29th, 30 additional Jews were forced to collect hay for the horses of the advance unit's cavalry. Given that the cavalry units were tasked with the reconnaissance of two neighboring villages the following morning, as stated in the Divisional War Diary, we have yet another example of how oral testimony can be, uh, can be supported by written sources while providing the researcher with a clearer sense of the interaction that occurred between this German army unit and the civilian, specifically Jewish, population. Of note is also the fate of the hostages, According to the Yitzkor book for Zettel, all 80 were subsequently released unharmed. Also of note is the pattern of the oral testimony garnered from the USC Shoah Foundation testimonies for Zettel that characterizes this first invasion force as polite and even friendly, although also referring to the plundering of Jewish homes committed by these frontline soldiers and their knowledge that they shared with Zettel's Jewish residents 
that they will have a tough time under German rule. My conclusion. For any scholar seeking to understand the intersection of the regular German army and the Holocaust, survivor testimony can be indispensable. As seen in the above examples, it does not need contest nor obfuscate the information gained from primary sources such as the war diaries, but rather often complements it. In fact, a scholar working exclusively with the war diaries would miss the true significance and nature of the events in Bielitsa, namely, how intertwined the War of Annihilation in the East and genocide were. Whether the synagogue was burned or dynamited may remain a point of contention, but neither account contests the fact that the synagogue was targeted and destroyed. With the details provided by survivor testimony and omitted from the division's war diary, it is also clear that after the initial cleansing of the town, soldiers of the 35th Infantry Division worked with local collaborators to identify and execute Jews. In Dwajic and in Jetl, we see this pattern reemerge. Jews were held responsible for any and all transgressions against German soldiers, regardless of any evidence, and they would be made responsible for any future transgressions. If this was the modus vivendi of one ordinary German infantry division in the first weeks of the war, one that has not been definitively linked to any well-known acts of genocide, what can we already extrapolate about the participation of German frontline units in the Holocaust? It also offers counter evidence to any hypothesis that frontline troops were either too far away from the centers of extermination or too busy prosecuting the war to engage in genocide. At the same time, the examples of Dwajic and Jetel illustrate the range of attitudes and latitude for action that can be found within this division, helping to distinguish these German military units from the killing squads that were to follow in their wake. As regards Holocaust history and testimony, there are increasing calls, as some of us have spoken about uh, at dinner last night, um, with perhaps the loudest coming from Jan Gross, for a paradigm shift in the handling of survivor testimony to a much broader acceptance and utilization of this source by historians. Christopher Browning, while questioning whether the default position should be switched to a less than critical reception of survivor testimony, argues that in the case of perpetrator testimonies, quote, if historians cannot find smoking pistol documents, they must look for pattern and fit among the evidence that is available. In my work with oral history to date, I have welcomed every opportunity to incorporate the memories and oral testimony of participants with the need to compare it to other sources that may confirm it. This trust but verify approach dovetails with Christopher Browning's focus on pattern and fit, while perhaps placing a greater emphasis on looking for other source types for verification. While I work extensively with oral history, especially the uh, Shoah Foundation testimonials, and strive to incorporate all perspectives on a particular issue, I acknowledge that regarding oral history, especially survivor testimony, there are limits to what an individual can process as they experience an event. While time often affects how an individual may recall an event at various stages in his or her life. But as the above examples of Bidetsa, Dvacic, and Jetl illustrate, the incorporation of survivor testimony into one's investigation of primary documentation is critical to a deeper understanding of events and therefore deserving of a more prominent place in Holocaust research. No single document or perspective can claim absolute truth, never mind absolute accuracy over events past. The multiple survivor testimonies from Bielitsa illustrate how one cannot investigate some questions, like the attitudes of ordinary Germans towards Eastern Jewry, without the help of such testimony. And Dvacic shows that even in instances where there is only one eyewitness to an event, this testimony can not only confirm primary documentation, but provide a richness of detail that reveals a different character to the events described. <coughs> Every document, even official ones, reflect to some degree the biases of its creator. Yet we often overlook this while dismissing oral history as too subjective, too laden with personal agenda or the frailties of memory to be accurate. In closing, I believe John Lewis Gaddis's observation gives us the necessary insight into why oral history should be considered 
much more broadly by historians. Like geologists and paleontologists, historians must allow for the fact that most sources from the past don't survive, and that most daily events don't even generate a survivable record in the first place. Like biologists and astrophysicists, they must deal with ambiguous or even contradictory evidence. And like the scientists who work outside of laboratories, historians must use logic to overcome the resulting difficulties. To seek out and engage the contradictions that may arise from a greater utilization of oral history combined with primary documentation is, in my estimation, work worth undertaking. Thank you. Thank you very much.